me between these two guys. And so, no, Stephen Jay Gould is stupid, wasn't stupid, neither is Simon Crowley Morris. Simon Crowley Morris says, yes, contingency, of course. Yes, of course it is for Mr. But what Crowley Morris would say is, <coughs> this little catastrophe here only forestalled the inevitable. It did not end forever the opportunity of evolution to explore this, this space. And in fact, his book is subtitled Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe. He's like, it was inevitable. I mean, those are strong <laughs> words, right? Gould, it couldn't be more different, at least on the surface. Run it back, forget it, you got no chance. Carmen Morris, run it back, it's inevitable. I can tell you what's going to happen over and over again. All right, so summary of Simon Conway Morris. Yes, sure, contingency matters. You know, come on. And yes, unpredictable things occur. He refers to the falling star that gave us our big chance. Um, but he says, all they do is, uh, if you will, first of all, be inevitable. Some things will happen no matter what. All right, now this is really an aside about Gould's interpretation, by the way, of the, of the Burgess Shale. Um, first of all, it does appear in retrospect that he overstated the nature of the shift in thinking. He makes it seem uh, cataclysmic. Now, Walcott, <coughs> that, that silly Presbyterian, uh, did his little shoehorn thing, and everyone marched in lockstep behind him until the heroes came forward doing who knows what, and he started <laughs> coming Morris with his hallucinogenia, said, no, those don't fit into any known, and there was a sort of seismic shift in the view of things, and then Steve arrived and wrote the book Wonderful Life and, and that settled it. That's probably overstating how, how things move, at least according to one expert that I'll read to you from. But much more importantly, he is thought to be wrong in this particular interpretation, and now what I'm going to refer to is the idea that each of these was a Burgess Shale group that was somehow extinguished, so experienced decimation, I suppose, and that these went on, and, and what was left behind were whole phyla or classes of organisms that the world has never seen again. Let me read to you a recent commentary from the journal Nature from last year on the, to celebrate the centennial of Walcott's discovery of the Burgess Shale. First, I can't resist reading some nice uh, flowery verbiage about the world himself. The author here is Desmond Collins, who made a lot of major discoveries and interpretations of the British show himself. Gould criticized Walcott for shoehorning his animals into known groups, so delaying the true understanding of the Burgess Shale animals. He attributed this to Walcott's conservatism and Presbyterian upbringing. <laughs> to me, this is nonsense. None of Walcott's contemporaries are indeed the scientists who followed him question Walcott's assumption that the Burgess Shale animals belong to living animal groups, not until Whittington, and that's the guy that Simon Cowley and Morris were. True, many of Walcott's assignments were wrong, but this led others to attempt to correct his mistakes, etc. And then finally, let me tell you that his, this, this expert's um, uh, verdict on our current understanding of the Burgess Shale. With a flood of new specimens coming from 12 seasons of excavation, yada yada, new forms are being described and old forms re-described. Today, we have returned mostly to Walcott's practice of <coughs> classifying Burgess Shale animals in living animal groups, but the groups are different. There are some extinct classes, such as such and such, but very few extinct phyla. Five of Gould's weird wonders have been classified, only one in a new phylum. This year, one of the conundrums from Walcott's time was solved. The claws of the king of the Cambrian world are now known to belong to Herdia, which is a terrible crab. All right, so he's saying, you know, no. No, we look at the Cambrian and we can, we can recognize things there. It's really, you know, Gould over, over interpreted this because he had an axe to grind. That seems to be where people stand on, on this, but here's what I don't think it matters because that's actually not, in my opinion, what Gould said that was so interesting. I don't care whether he was inspired by looking at the Burgess Shale or by just sitting around in his den thinking about the fact that if you extinguish the lineage, it might not contribute to the future. You know, you don't need to look at fossils to come up with an idea like that. No, I'm not playing this. So it doesn't address Gould's overall contention that extinction is real, it can be intense, evolutionary development is obviously contingent, and therefore small events can have large impacts on the evolutionary trajectory. The extent to which Gould is right about that is a live question in evolutionary biology, and there are very 
very recent papers, asking the question of how much of morphal space has been explored? How much is left unexplored? Those are my questions. They were not settled when someone figured out that Gould, characteristically, overstated himself. Uh, by the way, his obituary in the New York Times said he was as, as, as known for arrogance as for brilliance, so that might explain his tendency to overstate things. I, yeah. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> what are the interesting questions to close, hopefully leave you with ideas that you'll email me about? Um, so interesting questions um, that remain alive despite this sort of clash of the titans between Gould and, and Kanye Morris. Um, so first is the idea of biological possibility. Perhaps you've read silly little articles about can animals have wheels, things like that. Um, and, and, or especially seeing Gary Larson cartoons, pictures of cheetahs with wheels, and the horrifying ideas like that. So, but, but really, how big is morphospace? space? This picture kind of assumes that there is such a thing as morphospace space, and that you navigate through it, and that you can leave areas untouched. So how big is it? Obvious jokes about unicorns fit here, and other things like that. But, uh, you know, someone asked, where are the winged Horses, um, why don't horses grow wings? Wings happen, horses happen, why not? And, 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 and in all seriousness, how big is morphal space? People are trying to ask that question. It's not, the answer's not obvious. Some people really think, and Simon Conway Morris would go here and say, well, I don't know how big it is, but it's been mostly explored. There's not much left to do. That's pretty intense, right? And then other people say, no, it's, it's almost unimaginable. Unimaginably vast, and evolution is just pitifully crawling through and finding some good solutions. All right, so how big is morphal space? What are the limits on biological possibility? <coughs> uh, some of the answers might be obvious, but many aren't. People aren't thinking about that right now. Uh, second thing, well, how efficient is evolution at exploring morphal space? Gould, Gould and Conway Morris differ dramatically on that question, I think. Conway Morris thinks evolution is really good at this, really good. Give it a space, it'll, it'll find everything you need to find. Dan Dennett, atheist extraordinaire, would agree completely. He's like, you know, turn this mechanism loose somewhere, it'll find everything it needs to find. There might be boundaries around that, but it's question if they'll find it. So how has evolution exhaustively explored morphal space to the extent that's possible? That is a wild question. I think an interesting question. The fact that we can imagine horses with wings doesn't mean that they can happen, but it's not that easy to give an account of why horses don't have wings. Don't give me the law of nature graph. That doesn't work. OK, finally, so are there any questions here that a person of faith would find particularly important? Is there any, do we have a stake in this battle? Do we have a dog in this fight? Or can we just stand by and take notes? I'm waiting for the answer. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So you want to know what I think. Um, uh, well, it seems to me the one obvious question is, um, if that's us right there, I think we all agree with the creator's intention for us to be here. You, you, you don't have to be a believer to agree with that. So but I think we sort of agree that um, that, that, that ranks there, homo sapiens, and even more particularly, each of us, uh, was intended from the beginning, whatever we did by the beginning. Um, we could cite some pretty potent uh, verses about names being written in the Book of Life before one of them came to be. I mean, it's pretty clear. Um, so maybe that would constrain our cheering in this contest. Maybe we would prefer Conway Morris because he would say, you know, it was inevitable that something like us would come to be. I, I'm skeptical. I don't think that saves you. I don't, I don't think that answers the question of whether you were going to be here today or out of your mind listening to me. Whereas some interpretations of cosmic history from, from a theistic point of view would say, you know, it was well nigh predestined. So in any case, your birth seems to be an important event that God had in mind. And maybe, we, maybe if we vote for Conway Morris, we get a little bit closer to that. I don't know. My personal bias is that I figure that the guy who set this up was omnipotent, and it seems kind of silly for me to worry about how he made it all work, but that's just my sort of quirky, uh, you know, take on such matters. In any case, um, 
it's certainly true that and when we talked about this in our um, uh, random leaders group, it's certainly true that this contingency business where whatever went well there gave us those, and whatever kind of went disastrously wrong there meant none of those, that that contingency thing magnifies potential impact of chance events. 